you would please take out a Bible and turn with me to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew in chapter 7, we're going to consider as we begin our lesson here something that Jesus said. Nearing the end of his great Sermon on the Mount, a passage we consider quite often, we're going to consider it again in a little bit of a different context this morning. Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 21, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. As I said, we consider that passage quite frequently, especially in the last series of lessons that Alan and I have been doing on the minor prophets. One of the great problems that the children of Israel had was that they no longer knew God. And that is exactly what Jesus says. He says, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. The children of Israel had a great problem because they didn't know God any longer. And they were punished for it. They were sent out into exile for it. And you and I today, we may face the same kinds of problem, not knowing God. And so what I want to do this morning is I want to look at this passage in Matthew chapter 7, and I want to look at what it means to know Jesus. And more specifically, I want to look at what it means for Jesus to know you. There's a word. In the Greek, and this word is gnosko, and the word is translated so often as no. And the word is more than just a belief, it's more than just a mental acknowledgement. Oftentimes in the Bible, in the New Testament, when it talks about knowing, it talks about a personal relationship. The word often defined is to learn to know a person through direct personal experience implying a continuity of relationship. We see in the book of 1 John so many times about what it means to know Jesus and for what it means for Jesus to know you. In the book of 1 Corinthians, in chapter 8, in verse 2 and 3, we see that Paul says to love God is to be known by God. For God to know you, you have to love Him. That relationship that you have between you and God has to be based on love. And as Jesus says here in Matthew chapter 7, it also has to be based on obedience. It says, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So we see that to know and to have a relationship with God and with Christ, it requires us to love God. And it requires us to be obedient with God, to God, and to Jesus. We need to be in a, in a place in our life where we have a relationship with Jesus. And what I want to do this morning is I want to look at what it means to know Jesus. And more specifically, what it means for Jesus to know us. And we're going to take a bit of a different spin on this lesson. This Sunday was supposed to be Exorcism Sunday, if you didn't know that. Originally, when we had planned the schedule, Alan and I had both come up with lessons dealing with exorcism, not a topic we talk about very often. And we thought, wouldn't it be fun to put our lessons together on the same Sunday? And things didn't work out with the schedule as we had originally planned, so Alan preached his lesson on exorcism last Sunday, and this morning I'm going to preach mine. And don't worry, it's not all about the details of exorcism, because that probably wouldn't be a very profitable or useful conversation for us to have. But what I do want to do is jump off of this idea of knowing Jesus here as he talks about in Matthew chapter 7. There will be many on that day who say, did we not cast out demons in your name? It's really interesting. Now we know that Jesus had the power over demons. We saw that last Sunday. And we know that Jesus gave by his name and by his authority his disciples power over demons. What it also appears like is there were others who had the power over demons in order to do some amazing things in the lives of people in the first century when these things were being written. 
And what I want to do this morning is I want to look at two examples of those who cast out demons in Jesus' name. But I want to look at one of them that was successful and one of them that was an utter failure. And what I want us to do in, in seeing these things is understand that only when we know Jesus, only when Jesus knows us, only when we have a relationship with him, will our work be successful at all. And I want to talk about this morning, make application into our own lives, what it means to have a relationship with Jesus. And by extension, what it means then for us to go out and serve others in his name. And so we're going to look at two stories. The first is over in the book of Mark in chapter 9. Mark in chapter 9, I think many of you will be familiar with this story. This is one of the first times we see John being mentioned in the Gospels doing anything by himself. Normally it was James and his brother John doing things together. But here we see a picture of John as he says something to Jesus. John said to him in verse 38, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him. For no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. For the one who is not against us is for us. For truly, I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. So here we see John. And we'll talk more about this story in just a little bit. But John, if you want to call Peter impetuous, well, then you've got John. And John, as Jesus refers to him, or as Jesus has called him over in Mark chapter 3, calls him and his brother what? The sons of thunder. Man, I want that on a t-shirt. That, that's quite a name. That's quite a title. But it doesn't appear like it's a very positive title, actually. Because over in Luke chapter 9, we see James and John. What do they want to do to the city that rejects Jesus? Oh, they want to destroy that city, don't they? And in many manuscripts, we see Jesus respond to them, you have no idea what my purpose is. I didn't come here to kill. I came here to save. James and John are very impetuous. John specifically. And John here is the master of jumping to conclusions, is he not? And John is able to say here, these people, this person who's casting out demons, I wanted to stop him. And Jesus says, you better not. You better knock that off right now. But it looks like, it appears like this person, whoever he was, who was casting out demons, was doing so successfully, as we're going to see Jesus go on to talk about here in a little bit. It looks like this person was casting out demons in Jesus' name, and that was working. By the way, just how amazing that is. How amazing it is that not only Jesus' disciples could cast out demons, but by the power of Jesus and his name, anyone else or other people were able to do it as well. As Alan talked about in his lesson in Ephesians chapter 3, the power, the amazing power of God that's what? At work within us. And don't we see that here in this story? These people casting out demons in Jesus' name. But then we go to Acts chapter 19. Acts in chapter 19, I have to be honest, this is probably one of the funniest stories in the Bible. Just absolutely hilarious and very sad all at the same time. We see here in Acts chapter 19, verse 11, And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. Now, what an amazing thing Paul is doing. God is doing some amazing miracles through Paul. In fact, to the point where even handkerchiefs that touch him are able to cast out evil spirits in the lives of other people, heal other people, and cast out their demons. It's amazing stuff. And so we see these people, seven people, as we're going to see in just a second, who look and see what Paul is doing and say, I want to get in touch with that kind of power. I want to be able to do that too. And so we continue on in verse 13. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits. Hold on one second right there. Uh, just in case you didn't know, 
there were itinerant Jewish exorcists. Who knew? We don't see a whole lot about them, but they all of a sudden pop up in Acts chapter 19. And there's a whole discussion we could have on this. There are reasons, actually. And you can see them in the Dead Sea Scrolls. You can see some of these writings from Josephus, where all the way back in the Old Testament, exorcism was actually talked about, even though we don't see a whole lot about it. In some of these extra-biblical writings, we see these, these ideas of exorcism being deeply ingrained in the Jewish people. And by the way, when they were looking for the Messiah, who were they looking for? They were looking for the son of David who could cast out demons. They were looking for the one who had the power over demons. And so, we see here that there were these Jewish exorcists who decided, let's go ahead and, and follow suit with Paul and use the name of Jesus. And so they say, I adjure you by the Jesus, whom Paul proclaims. If you could put a parenthesis in there, I'd probably do that. By the Jesus, whom Paul proclaims. Seven sons of the Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. But the evil spirit answered them, Jesus, I know. And Paul, I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leapt out on them, mastered all of them, and overpowered them, so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, and fear fell upon them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. Two amazing stories. One of them a success. One of them an utter failure both having to do with casting out demons. And I'm going to contend this morning that the difference between the two groups is being known by Jesus. That it's Jesus and your relationship with him that provides you power. But if you have no relationship with Jesus, no amount of superficial activity is ever going to be productive or successful. And so let's go now and learn some of the lessons from these two stories, make some applications into our own life, and what I want to do first is go back to Mark chapter 9, and I want to talk about tolerance for a second. I think sometimes in conservative churches, we view the word tolerance as an anathema, as something that we don't want to talk about very often. But that is exactly what Jesus says to John in Mark chapter 9. And we see here that there are some very unnecessary dividing lines that we can make. And don't we do this today? As a society, don't we do this? As a culture, don't we do this? And they did it all the way back, back here as well. We divide over anything and everything. We divide over the color of our skin. We divide over our, our possessions and our material uh, wealth and ability. We divide over our political uh, beliefs and ideals. We divide over anything and everything. And we see that here in Mark chapter 9, verse 38, when John says, Teacher, I saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him. Why? Because he was not following us. Apparently, in John's mind, the qualifying factor of somebody being able to do good things in the name of Jesus was, you are in my small peer group. You are in my band of disciples. You are here in my little group. And Jesus has to break it to him. Jesus is not going to put up with this. I'm sure in John's mind, John was thinking Jesus was going to say, absolutely, let's go get those guys, those charlatans, those heathens, those hypocrites. But what does Jesus say? Do not stop him. For no one who does a mighty work in my name will be, soon will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. For the one who is not against us is for us. And now let's drop down to verse 42. And you can start to see how Jesus really feels about this man who was casting out demons in his name. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me, now just stop right there. What does it imply that this person who was casting out demons in the name of Jesus was? He was a believer. He was one of Jesus' little ones. It's a relationship that Jesus had with him with this one who was casting out demons. He had a relationship with him. Even though he wasn't among the number of disciples that they had there, he was still one of Jesus's. And then he says something to John, which I just find amazing. He says, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, 
It would be better for him to have a great millstone that were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. What does Jesus say? In a sense, he's saying this directly to John. John, it would be better if you were dead than for you to cause these other people who believe in me to stumble. Whoa. Really? How do you think John is feeling right about now? He's probably feeling about this tall. You mean, you mean to say, Jesus, that it would be better if I were thrown into the bottom of the sea? Wow. And then he goes on to talk about salt. He goes on to talk about the, the, the consequence of hell. And then he says in verse 50, salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and what? And be at peace with one another. That is the lesson we all need to hear today. There are other people in other churches, there are people in other places who are trying to do things according to God's will. They may not be in our little band, but don't you ever, ever become a stumbling block for someone who is known by Jesus. Because Jesus says it would be better for you to be dead. That is heavy. And it's a great responsibility. It's such a great responsibility, in fact, that even Paul, over in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, would say on the subject of eating meats that were sacrificed to idols, I would rather not ever eat meat again than to ever cause one of my brothers to stumble because of my choices. The church is a varied organization, is it not? We're all different. We all have different roles. We all have different responsibilities. We all come from different backgrounds. And even within our own number, if you draw unnecessary lines between yourself and your brothers, watch out. Because Jesus says some very hard things about what will happen to us if we do those things. And we see that, obviously, in James chapter 2. Amazing to me that James, that one of the sons of thunder, speaks eloquently in James chapter 2 about what it means to show partiality and why we should not be judges with evil motives. Apparently, James learned his lesson. And by the way, I think John learned his lesson because in 1 John, we see all kinds of talk about love. And this lesson that John is learning here is something that I think really sunk in and hit home. But lest we think that we are talking about an all-inclusive church in which we never draw any lines at all, well, there absolutely are dividing lines that need to be made. And then in Acts chapter 19, we certainly see that. We see these ones who were not known by Jesus, and guess what? Not even the demon would let them get away with this. They said, the demon said, Jesus I know and Paul I recognize, but who are you? The demon did not recognize them at all. The demon didn't, didn't care anything about them. And, and I would say that if the seven sons of Sceva were actually doing what they were supposed to be doing, then just like they recognized Paul, they would have recognized the seven sons of Sceva. But they didn't. And they weren't doing the right things. And they eventually failed miserably for it. We have to make sure as it talks about, as Paul, Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 11, we have to make sure not to have anything to do with the unfruitful works of darkness and instead do what? Expose them. We absolutely have to make sure that we are drawing lines of distinction on matters in which our brothers and our sisters are doing things that are sinful. And Paul talks at length about that. Yes, in 1 Corinthians, he's talking about unity, but at the same time, he is absolutely saying you get that leaven out of your midst. And so we need to make sure that we are not going from one extreme to the other and that we are having a nuanced balance of what it means to really judge among ourselves. We need to judge what is wrong and make sure we take care of that. But on these petty things, on these insignificant, meaningless things, surface level things, don't draw lines of distinction where there aren't any. Because Christ's intention is that for all of us who know him 
are united together. That we are not some sect, that we are not some denomination, that we are not some divisional group within ourselves, that we are all united together. So consider your prejudices. But then we see that knowing leads to service. And back in Mark chapter 9, we see this one who is casting out demons in Jesus' name. And Jesus makes the comparison here to him casting out demons and someone who would, in verse 40, or verse, verse 41, someone who would give you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ. Now, what is the comparison there between casting out demons and giving someone a cup of water to drink? Well, it's all about sacrifice and service, isn't it? You and I may not be able to cast out demons in Jesus' name today, but you and I absolutely can give a cup of water in the name of Jesus. And as you go to Matthew chapter 25, you absolutely see that as being one of the, the requirements of our lives before God in judgment. If you gave someone a cup of water in my name, you did it to me, Jesus would say. And so, we need to be ones who are hospitable in Jesus' name, doing things for the service of others in Jesus' name, by his authority. Why? Well, in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 21, it tells us to submit to one another out of what? Or why? Motivated by what? Out of reverence for Christ. You and I are to serve one another because we respect and honor our King. And as Jesus got down on his knees and washed his disciples' feet, as he got down on his knees and prayed three times that this cup would pass from him, and eventually got up and went to that cross anyway, doing the Father's will, giving his life as a sacrifice for us, he gave you everything. And what are you willing to give to others in his name? We have such a great blessing in the church. You can look at it in Acts chapter 2. You can see the wonderful sharing that they had. They sold the things that they had. They gave their proceeds to the poor among them. They cared for one another. It was exactly, exactly the fulfillment of Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added to you. All of the material things they could have needed were going to be given to them where? In the church in the service of their brothers, in the service of their sisters. If they had a need, their need was taken care of. And today, we do that still. We took up this collection just a little bit ago. And I guarantee you, many of the funds that are being taken up in that collection are going to help individual members here who have need. And we follow the example, and it's such an amazing example. But more than even just putting some money into the plate, you and I need to be hospitable. We need to be the kind of people who pray with each other, who make time for each other, who consider one another, and who care about each other. We have to be of service to each other because Jesus was of such great service to us. But then on the other side of that, we see this superficial self-sacrifice in Acts chapter 19. The seven sons of Sceva, well, their words gave them away, didn't it? Because they said... I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Were they sincere? Did they really know Jesus? Not at all. Why were they doing these things? I imagine it has a lot to do with Matthew chapter 6, those, those tax collectors, those, those, or the Pharisees, excuse me, the Pharisees who stood on the street corner praying in the sight of all people. And what does Jesus say there? They have their reward. They do all their works to be seen by men. They do all their works out of their own pride and their own arrogance and their own self-satisfaction. How do you serve? Do you serve because you love Jesus? Do you serve because you want a relationship with him? Or do you serve so that people will pat you on the back and say, what a great job you did. Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians about the unpresentable parts still being absolutely required in the work that we do. There are times where, where we will have jobs to do within his kingdom that no one will ever see. And the Lord blesses us even in those works, even more so. Yes, it's great that I get to stand up here in front of everyone, but the work that you do behind the scenes that no one may ever see 
is so much more important. And I hope you believe that. And I'm sure Sean would say the same thing. I think we have a great opportunity in all the aspects of what we do, not only in public worship, not only out in front doing things where people can see, but also doing things behind the scenes. Why? Because we all are useful and we all are needed. Which is why we cannot draw unnecessary lines of distinction, because we are all necessary to his work. And the last lesson I want us to see from these two verses is that there is a great result in being known by Jesus, is there not? And that's what we see in Mark chapter 9, as Jesus talks about this one who was casting out demons in his name. And what does he say of this one? He says... He will by no means lose his reward. He will by no means lose his reward. We have a reward, a great reward. And we could see it on the other side in Matthew chapter 7, couldn't we? We only saw the negative side of it, where some were facing destruction. But on the other side of that, those who do follow Christ, those who do have a relationship with Christ, those who are known by Christ, have a reward and not a punishment. And just to be clear, this reward is not this life. I know we want to think about health and wealth and, God, and, the, and the wonderful prosperity gospel that many preach. And wouldn't it be nice if we just were able to go through our whole lives at great peace and prosperity? Yes, that would be good, maybe, unless it distracted us from what we need, needed to be focusing on. But you and I could live our whole lives like Job did without anything, with having everything taken away from us. We could go through trial, we could go through difficulty, we could suffer for our faith, we could lose everything that we had, and you know what we would still have? Hope of the reward in heaven. That is what we're looking for. That is what we focus our attention on. This world is not our home. We're just passing through. We're just on our way. We're sojourners. We're pilgrims on our way to our heavenly home, which is our reward. And that reward will only come when we love God, when we follow God, when we do everything that He tells us to do, when we have a relationship with Him. And when we're known by Jesus, He will take us home to that place that He's prepared for us where we can be with Him for eternity. And if you don't want to have a relationship with Jesus now, well, then you're probably not going to look forward to being with Jesus for all eternity, are you? It's important. And I hope it's something that we all want and we all focus on every day. But then on the other side of it, in Acts chapter 19, we see that for those who are not known, well, there is great destruction and there is great defeat, is there not? And we see that destruction and we see that defeat right here. The demon says, Jesus, I know, Paul, I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped out on them mastered all of them and overpowered them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. That is terrible. That is humiliating. But I guarantee you this. Your destruction, your defeat, as Jesus talks about in Matthew chapter 25, when you hear those words, if you hear those words, depart from me, I never knew you, enter into the eternal pit that was set aside for the devil and his angels, Oh, you would rather be naked and wounded. You would rather be suffering some physical consequence because that torment will be eternal in nature. And if we don't know Jesus, we will suffer the consequences for it. And that is a sobering thought. It's something we need to consider seriously. And it should motivate us to go back into a loving relationship with Jesus if you're not already. And so the closing question here really is, are you known by Jesus? This is a personal question. This is only a question you can answer. Does Jesus know you? If you were to put yourself there in Matthew chapter 7, and Jesus was talking about you, what would he say? Would he say that he knows you? Or would he say, I never knew you. Depart from me. It's a question we need to think about. And... Take out your songbooks and turn to the number that's been announced. I want to do one last thing just here really quickly. 
I think sometimes it's hard for us to wrap our mind around knowing Jesus because we don't see Jesus. Jesus is not in our number here today. He's in our midst. But physically speaking, he's not here. We don't see God, yet we're called to a relationship with God. And sometimes I think we, we have a hard time wrapping our mind around that. But I want to say this. And we're going to study about this on Wednesday night. But in Ephesians chapter 5, Paul talks about the relationship that Christ has with the church. And he says that the relationship that Christ has with the, ch with the church is like a husband's relationship to his wife. And I will contend this morning that this idea of knowing, being known, is very similar to the relationship that you have with your spouse. And I think there is a very specific reason why God created marriage. Because marriage is the relationship that you have in a physical sense, which God has created, God has given you, which shows you and teaches you about your relationship with Him. If your relationship with your spouse is successful, is it because you're communicating with each other? Could I say, are you communicating with God in prayer? Is your relationship with your spouse successful because you are faithful to each other? Are you faithful to your God in all things? Is your relationship with your spouse successful because you serve each other? Well, do you serve God with all that you have? I think, and I truly believe from Ephesians chapter 5, that marriage is the perfect test bed for understanding what it means to wake up every single day and commit yourself to the relationship between you and God. So consider those things today. If you are subject to the gospel call, please, please, please do not delay. And understand that you have an opportunity to start knowing Jesus right now. Come now as we stand and sing.